So, 
thanks for coming to the HBS VOF. Uh, I want to thank all the works for sponsoring this event. Um, before we get started, just a few quick notes. The format of this event is it's going to be 15 minutes long for every speaker, followed by a five minutes QA. Um, please hold off your question answers to the end of every speaker's talk. Uh, finally, we have four speakers to the topic, uh, actually, four, four talks. So, we we'll first going to go with Jimmy, and then we'll talk about four of them with Mother and Master. Then, Pass, then we'll come and talk about consensus based application and use case and other distributed systems. Uh, next, we have John and uh, Dave talk about how to SRI, talk about common encoding, uh, screen for each case, and uh, last we have to talk about block cache one hour. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you, Jimmy, and let's get on with this. Thank you. So, my name is uh, Jimmy, and uh, I'm a software engineer at uh, Mamaya. So, today I'm going to talk about uh, how to keep the memory with the master. So, it's, uh, it's a part I just finished uh, this one. So, I'm going to talk about uh, some bug call, then I will talk about the change and the computability issue, and some follow up of uh, issues. Then I can put some questions at the end. So I address the background. So in that phrase, the types of tasks are coordinated by the master, such as the uh, online signal change and the creator table, the meter table, and the snapshot. So, but we don't have a generic uh, framework for it. So they the geo for this issue is address five four eight seven. It's still open now. Now in this geo. There are lots of comments, and uh, uh, most of the comments are about the region assignment because the region assignment is uh, kind of uh, uh, related to what this kind of things on the online schema change, created in the table. So there are two very popular ideas in, uh, come out of that geo. So the first one is according to the map of the master. The second one is to the region assignment is on the So the reason for the other one uh, is uh, you know, for the region assignment we need to use the region state. The region assignment based on the region state. So you know the region is open over here, it's, uh, it's closed, we need to assign someone. But the region state must be consistent so for the property uh, assignment. But you say suppose the region assigns someone but the mask doesn't do it. Then probably you will assign something else again. So it's kind of all assignment. So the region state must be consistent. Currently, the, re the region of uh, state of the is uh, stored in the table, in, also in the master memory and in the gene table. It is hard to know, you know which one is source of the So it's kind of complex. So, and the thing about the region assignment of interactions is very complex currently on the left side. So you know the master need to talk to the region server, and need to talk to the bookkeeper, and the region server need to talk to the bookkeeper, and need to update the meta, you know. So the interaction is very complex. So that's why you know the community <coughs> and many people want to simplify the thing, come up with the two ideas, you know. To Call it the meta and master and the region assignment with the people. So the, on the right side is the stack with the behavior. So it looks like much similar, right? So the meta master talk to region server, region server talk to master, and the meta is inside the meta. So only the master can update the meta. So I find a geo into the edge base of 10569. So I work on this feature. It's, a, it's, a, it's what I'm going to talk about. So it's kind of a first step to simplify the master and then the region assignment. At, at first, uh, next I will talk about the, the 
changes are in the compatibility. So for the changes, so with this patch, the master, the attribute based master is also a region server. So it used to be you know, master is master of region server. Now the master is also a region server. They share one region uh, RPC server, they list on the RPC uh, region server RPC core. And uh, they share the one web you are, the region server what you are for. And uh, the request to the older master what uh, master what you are is to be are you directed to the new uh, what you are. And the meta region is hosted on the on the other master. So that's the uh, this is our one we want to do. It is changing. It's enforced by the node of answer. So the node of answer make sure the meta is the meta region is on the master. And, uh, and it's not a strong or hard code. So that's uh, that's how that's why you know the meta region can be on other region server. But uh, so for some compatibility issue. But uh, you know it's enforced by the local balance the community is on the active master. The active master can host some system regions. It can host the meta region, namespace region. It's a based on configuration, so we can uh, put the nest regions on the meta, uh, other master, master node. The, the, the next big change is the background master. It's a, it's a region server, right? So they can host some uh, regions. And uh, based on some configuration, you can do the name idle as before, or you can uh, put the less regions on the background master, just like uh, uh, to uh, avoid some mechanical and mechanical issue. And uh, once the background master becomes uh, become, become, uh, becomes the active master, so the existing regions on the mark, on the background master will be moved that way and the uh, answer. So that's why you know, that could be some impact on data mechanism. So that's why sometimes you don't want to host uh, too many regions on the background master. So basically this is the change. You know. So one thing Master is a one, it's also a region server, you share the same office of server, you share the same one you have. Meta is on master, uh, it's enforced by uh, data. So there's no RPC problem change, no API change, and no functionality change. It's a totally transparent to applications. And then we know the master RPC port is changed to using the region server RPC port, but that part is still in. So the application is just a good computer data, so it's, it's okay. It's very low compatibility. And for the master work UI, you know, there's a redirect server, redirect server, so you know, there's no impact of that. And we even we even change any spa, spa, and other security. So there's no compatibility issue. However, there is a one one feature actually is the deployment impact. Because they used to, you know, assume the background master is kind of idle, right? Doesn't do anything. You know, the active master is uh, neither waiting at all and it doesn't do really much. But actually now, you know, they, they can host some readings. They need some resource and they Use memory and CPU. So if you use it to assume you know, the background master is kind of idle, you could be uh, you could uh, you know get a big spot. So so that's what we want to tell everyone, you know, the deployment to impact by this feature. And uh, and the other thing is you know uh, when the master fails over, usually to be a mini library, you know, start up the master, scan the data, and assign the Now, when the master fails over, they 
the data may be namespace may be needed to be reassigned. And the data may be uh, maybe a concept or some good. So it doesn't matter. And the good thing is, you know, the normal region server, when they fail over, uh, there is no impact to the data. Because it used to be, data used to be, could be on any region server. If the other region server is dying, then it's very complex. So when you assign the data at first, then you do the fail. So, uh, another thing is, you know, it uh, could be a very minor issue, but I uh, just want to remind everyone. If you have some custom core processors and monitoring tools or applications, you assume the mask is separate from the region server, so it's not there anymore. So you probably need to make sure you change the application or change your application or core processor. And uh, the solutions. You know, for solutions, you know, we can change our, there are two solutions. One is to change the default settings. Another one is, you know, we just release mode. Put the list in change in the release mode so we don't, uh, by default, we don't, we still keep the older deployment uh, style. So. so the main takeaway for this is, you know, the deployment impact should it be properly handled during the operator you know, to avoid the enemy supply. So um, let's um, talk about some follow-up issues. So this uh, the core locator meta and mask is just a first step. So we are not done yet. So with this part, we can get some benefits. So the first one, the meta doesn't have to compete with the with the any user readings. Especially if some main user region is really hard, because the meta is unlikely to be on the other one, then you could run into some issue. So, with this part, the meta you know, is on its own user server, so it's really a good thing for your application. The other thing is, you know, the backup master doesn't have to stay idle. You can put some regions on the other backup masters. So, it doesn't have to be. Uh, for too many regions, but you can you can control the number of regions, so which is good. So the, for the second one, it is the region assignment with all the new people. Uh, this actually is one one zero five nine. So I'm still working on this one. I'm kind of almost done, but then I'm not done yet. So the that part is uh, uh, the second. Uh, Open up the ideas uh, I mentioned. So for that change, I it's a couple of compatible, it's uh, going up upgradable. Up and I did some integration testing and I did some performance testing. The performance seems to be good. And I'm doing more testing. The the thing is you know with all the zoom people, you know, the, the flow is much simpler. So uh, the team people who run the process is we don't have that issue at all. So it's the performance is much better. And after the file that is here, I know we can clean up quite some code. We have lots of the code to deal with the vision assignment, uh, you know, the team people are related, so we can and the other thing is the tests. So we have now had some tests to simulate this racing condition related to the region assignment. And uh, we can remove that one. We can also simplify the region state machine. So we can make the code much clean and easy to maintain and easy to uh, So with that, this is my talk. some questions. Yeah. So what's the computer? I'm talking about the 
uh, it's like this. Uh, once the active master is uh, done, right? So the meta division is done with that master. So when that master will takes over, becomes active master, right? So that master is the active master. That is uh, the process for the backup master to become the master, the uh, active master, it will assign the backup again on its own, you just say. So that's the reason assignment, not assignment. That also brings up the point. So until so far, if master goes down, the data access pattern is not impacted as long as the meta region is also going to be zero. Now, if master goes down, even the data becomes unavailable. They cannot access the data. That's right. Yeah. So that's the because uh, in the old style, if the region server holds the data is down, the new client cannot access it. means that now you cannot ha not have a backup master if you want to. Have. You have to have a backup master already. <laughs> yeah, that's a good practice. Yeah. And uh, the other thing is, you know, generally the master used generally should be on a better machine than other region servers. So the chances that master go down should be so lower than other region servers. Yeah? Um, this is uh, yeah, this yeah. Is, that's a very good idea, but uh, I don't know, this is still under discussion, but uh, for me, I think that it's better to specify a list of machines to, to be able to host them all. Because this way, you know, the application doesn't have to go to any machine and you know, say, oh, this, this one the master, this one the master. So I prefer to have a master core. So only those machines can post that. And uh, in that case, we can put some better machines for this master. And uh, it will be easier to debug in, so find the log file, find the empty master. This, uh, I don't know, so this is very hard to have to say. So uh, is there a plan so, to support split? Or meta regions will be distributed and what the region is asking. There is a Jira uh, word file and uh, uh, what's his name? Suppose you are here work on it. Yeah, there is a yeah. Oh, Thank you. Now we have calls coming to our board and this is based on the chip. Is that you think that works? So the what? No, 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 I said RGB. Uh, 
I'm not even there yet. Yeah, I see. I see the monitor, but they do not have to move anything in there. Okay. See, but in the mirror mode, they cannot actually do this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In there, down there. Oh, okay, let's see. No, nothing. Anyway, let's let's keep it on since um, there is nothing important on the slides. Anymore. Um, so, my name is Kaz Constantine Pudding. I want to know the company called Magistra, and uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we do for consensus based duplication in distributed systems. Uh, my slides are mostly a bunch of. Wait, where is that now? bunch of. Uh, uh, zero numbers, so I will just just output them. So, um, so it is. So uh, I basically we're going to cover um, the, the status of uh, a few JIRAs here um, that we've been working on and trying to move forward to help uh, what we do is a better approach to duplicate on the state instruments. And uh, uh, just to start, for, for those who, who, who weren't following this, weren't following this development uh, on the WST or, or JIRAs, a uh, couple of couple points to, to consider. So basically, the main idea behind the coordination, uh, the location of coordination based duplication is that instead of trying to be the failure, which is always the active action, the damage is done in trying to kind of recuperate from it, right? We offer to instead work on coordination of the damage. So basically, or the deliberation, we make sure that that version can be able to go And if this is possible, then the knowledge about that version is being independently applied to every single state machine, active state machine, duplication of the state machine, but they have a good idea from the state machine, I'm sorry. Um, independently from each other, because they don't share the media, and uh, um, if any of the monsters will be the state machine, so we'll go down. Client can go over to the next one and everything is still good because all these things are actually not in the same, in the same state. So that approach allows to have this distributed system with multiple active masters. So it's a user media to get each additional HE where you always have the steps to active and standby and there is always some indicated set of the steps involved or fell over from that to the same body. The state was properly synchronized and yada yada yada, right? Within the brand. So essentially, this approach allows us to have a single copy of the state. 
Now, in the sense of well, how, how, how it's going and where we are, so first of all, uh, when we looked at the space code, uh, we noticed immediately as pretty much everyone here, I guess, the fact that as we were to use uh, an integral part of pretty much every school system in, in many ways, and uh, as uh, Jim just pointed out, the fact that it was separated uh, in, in some, some places uh, to make it you know, less cumbersome and more, more clean. So the HP is 10, 9, or 9 is the number of years where the whole separation effort is happening. And it's pretty much actually closing, getting to the, to the, to the close, getting to the final, final point. Um, mainly, it's given those transactions happen, separated uh, region, open, close events, happen spread from super. Zero people, uh, super people has been split into the interface and the location now, so it's not clear. So we'll look forward to the bigger people. Now it's easy to do. So uh, at any rate, <clears throat> um, the issue that is still open is uh, wall splitting and uh, uh, split loss for the master and the worker is to be done so it's to get that away from these people. And if you go over to the listeners part, it's that in the level of 73. It's a big, big one because there's a bunch of listeners and there's the watchers and they need to be careful with the least ways, uh, let's say, the identification model there. Right? Because if you think about this, the way the events are going to spread, I uh, mean, uh, spread in the um, one for the sound systems, it's when the unit is reached, it is being executed, and the execution of the unit essentially is the work right now, the listening. Um, next steps, uh, once this computer is, is sort of uh, well defined and here with the different interfaces, is a uh, support for multiple active interfaces uh, of each master. So this is base 11 and 241. Uh, that one is sort of blocked right now because in order to pursue this, this year, we need to have an ability to, or we need to have actually a reference communication for that information at any time. Because otherwise, we cannot have the common cases of essentially working with the reason. Because also, you know, without the common cases, we cannot pursue this multiple, multiple reference. Um, on top of that, the client has to be aware about multiple masters so that we actually have a little Another. And uh, um, that work has started in the, the, uh, into the common component. And there is a reason for that, we'll talk about this for a moment. Uh, that work is being wrapped into group 10641. So, combination engine. 10641 10, 10, the has a reference implementation, so you can right now reference implementation for pipeline. Plus, it introduces uh, some common APIs that could be used by essentially any alternative implementation of the application. And just to uh, um, give a little bit of overview about the combination engine, essentially, this is a system that provides an ability to generate the globally new sequences of events, right? Or get Getting the agreement on the proper sequence, probably the proper sequence of events. Basically, when the sequence is integrated over the multiple clusters, the execution of the announcing sequence would always lead to the same sequence so of events, as the code of the sequence. So, when the combination engine could be implemented on the process of the right? so it doesn't matter. So, the, the, the reason we, we chose so if you go to the place of right now, because you can go along, uh, it's only part of the place, it's part of the, you know, the GFS PGM, and then the place of the same type of So, um, apparently, the library recognition engine should be able to sleep with it, it should be able to sleep with the machine by itself, and the task to provide certain APIs such as a second proposal, can propose, Start uh, board building, resume building, and so on. 
And the idea of the also not to have a summary of the one process of the Every single node in the system has different roles or all the roles at the same time. The node could be a proposer, a worker, or a receptor. And the proposer is the one who proposes. And then after that, the receptor is taking part of the decision and the worker is actually just one what the decision has been made and why the decision has been made for the decision. And the importance of this whole new guy is any individual information uh, agent would provide this functionality for the client is out to affect the client. Anyway, uh, a couple of references here, and then hopefully slides will be a little bit different with some of the developers later on. So we have design document proposed, uh, information agent design document proposed on uh, um, the Jira. And, uh, if this 10909 has a bunch of videos under the reference to the multiple master videos, design document, the only thing that I'll wrote actually years ago, a few weeks ago. And uh, uh, we're going forward, so hopefully in a couple of months we'll have we'll some more because it's time to push. Thanks, Klaus. Uh, so now we have John and I talking about common and coding skin features. So today, you have all of these different systems, possibly your own applications or things like Apache Phoenix or um, Hive. Hive is actually the project that I work on. And we all have different ways of storing data in HBase. Right? HBase wants to store bytes, and we all do that slightly differently. So we don't have a whole lot of overlap in these encodings. Hive serializes things as Avro objects if they're complex. Phoenix has its own encodings and, and backward compatibility. We don't do decimal the same way, right? If I want to read a Phoenix table through Kite, or Phoenix wants to read a Kite table, then we have a problem today. So what we want to do is actually solve that problem by coming up with a standard and an agreement on how we're all going to write data, um, at least for certain applications. We're not saying this is the only way to write data. We're just saying that this is a way to write data. OK. So I'm going to skip what type is. And this is all that relevant. Um, the takeaway from this slide is really that we want to store bits of a record as uh, columns in each case. They might be complex records. It might be something where I'm taking a map and shredding that across several uh, columns. Um, and it, it needs to have the underlying support for things like atomic data. OK. So the goals that we're setting out to solve are, are uh, minimal, clear, and support for pushing. So uh, a specification like this needs to be very small. So if we want Impala and Phoenix and a lot of different systems to all implement the same thing, we don't want to say you can do you, know, you can write integers into HBase in 10 different ways. We want to have one and only one clear, correct way of writing that thing. So while this is not as flexible as some applications may require, um, we want to encourage adoption this way. And if we need to revise that later, then we can go back and add more um, The second thing, uh, minimal and clear is kind of two sides of the same issue. Uh, push down. We want as many operations to be carried out on encoded bytes as possible. 
So let me give an example. Um, we have then comparable encodings, which is when you compare the bytes that have been uh, that have the representation of some data point, we want those bytes uh, to have meaning for the actual data. So I can compare the bytes themselves, and I'm actually comparing the number or the string that those bytes represent. Okay. So a little uh, side topic on how this is structured. The specification is actually structured as two parts. First of all, um, how we encode things as bytes. So we have a couple different situations and a couple different ways of encoding things, where the bytes themselves need to be kind of comparable, or where we want to delegate to an existing format, which is actually a protobuf, and just take advantage of that instead. Now, there's also how to represent types or, or higher level things, like a date or a string. Now, we don't necessarily want to say, this is how you take a string and Unicode characters and things like that and turn them into non comparable bytes. What we want to have is a separation there, where we say, this is how you take binary and turn it into non comparable bytes. This is how you take integers or floats and turn them into non comparable bytes. And if we're using a different underlying encoding, then we still want everything to be done the same way. So I have two examples here. Uh, the first is a string, where the representation is going to be UTF-8. So whether we're storing that inside a protobuf or whether we're storing that in a non-comparable binary, it's going to be UTF-8 encoded. Then we actually put that into the underlying format, the, the, the final bytes, by uh, some encoding strategy. Um, the other example of date might be a little more clear. So we have a four-byte integer, the number of days since the Unix, Unix epoch, for example, and that is the representation, right? And that's not going to differ between the underlying encoding strategies, whether we have a date embedded in a protobuf record or just a date that's actually inside our record. Okay. So we have three situations that we have to worry about for this encoding. Uh, the first is, how are we going to produce compound keys? And I mentioned mem comparable encodings earlier. What we want to do is have this, uh, this mem comparable encoding for different types that we can stack up inside a compound key, because that's a really, really common use case. Um, the second is a single value encoding. Now, this is where you're storing a particular value in a column family, column qualifier, and we want certain operations to be available. So, for instance, we want that to support atomic uh, operations, atomic increment, atomic append, whatever HBase chooses to support. And the third situation is where we have a compound value. So we're actually taking uh, a list or a map and storing that in a single column in a column qualifier, or a, a sum record or something like that. So we actually define for these three situations two encoding. The mem comparable encoding is used for number, numbers one and two, and protobuf is used for the third. Just cool. So the mem compare encoding, like I said, we want this to be as simple as possible. We're going to encode a lot of different types through these encodings, and we define three mem comparable things that we can do, these three body operations. So we define how to store integers. And that's pretty simple. Flip the side bit, uh, stores big Indian, and I'm sure many of you have used this in the past. There's a trick for floating point numbers that gets the, the same job done. Uh, it's a little more involved. You have to use the IEEE 754 bits, then flip the sign bit. If it's negative, invert the, the rest of it, and uh, it, this actually works for for infinity, not a number, and, and those sorts of things as well. So it's all comparable. If we take any two floating point numbers, turn them into bytes, and compare those bytes, we will actually get the result that we would have gotten when we compared those numbers. Now, the third encoding is just bytes. Um, bytes actually relies on your bytes being in a mem comparable format as well. 
But this does certain things to ensure we can embed those bytes inside a compound key. Specifically, we uh, one length encode the number of the null bytes within it and have a two byte term there so we know where those appear. This ensures that we can encode arbitrary binary strings or you know, arbitrary uh, bytes and still get a mem comparable encoding uh, at the end. So the example down here, um, if we have three nulls in a row, and then we have a null byte followed by a three, then we actually flip all of the bits in that three and get zero, zero FC, and then we would append two null bytes to signal with that binary. A couple more things to mention about uh, mem compare encoding. We don't define any unsigned types. We don't define variants. Everything is big and this is fairly strict, right? Because we want a, a small set of things if ever it's going to be. Next, we, we want to take these mem comparable uh, primitives and stack them up to have uh, key encodings. So the key encoding, uh, we have two options that we've discussed uh, so far, and we actually, I'm going to present both of those because part of what we need to solve, uh, hopefully in discussion later, is which of these encodings is going to be better, what can we do for this uh, specification. So this is, uh, the first one is modeled basically on protobuf, but using the then comparable uh, types underneath. So you have these uh, tag bytes that encode the field number first and then a little bit of information about the wire type or the, the format, which basically tells you how long this type of is. And that's uh, limited to 16 fields because we shift the field number and uh, then use the length. Then we, this, uh, so what we actually do is we have the tag byte and then the encoded value using the and you stack those up, and uh, when those are sorted as binary, then you get sorting by the field position, then the underlying type, if, if there's a difference in the wire type, and then uh, sorting by the actual values themselves. So, um, oh, and the other thing to mention here is that null is just represented as no bytes. Because if we're living in things with the field number, then we no longer have Need to store any by now because field two missing means we're comparing a field three with a field two, and uh, three is the sorry, two is also three, so uh, no sort to the end. The other option is a little simpler, it's modeled on the ordered bytes, it's already in uh, HBits, and that just has multiple fields with one byte prefixes where instead of using both the field number as well as a type, we just have a, a type. So that sorts by type and then value, and we can handle nulls in that representation by having uh, an agreed upon value or a type that signals it. And in that case, we can choose to null sort to the beginning or to null sort to the end, and uh, it, it just introduces a single point. Um, the catch there is that all fields have to be present. Everything has to have a type by okay. The single value encoding that we're proposing, this is uh, case number two from that overview slide, um, is just to use mem compare primitive encodings for any cell containing a single value. Um, so atomic, uh, the atomic increment works with the encoded format, so um, you just have to flip the sign of whatever you're adding to it. And, and that works for 832 and 64. Um, the other thing I should point out here is that if we use this encoding for the single values, then we can do comparisons using uh, just the encoded bytes for whatever we're comparing against. So if we wanted to say that a particular uh, cell is less than 5 and greater than 3, for instance, we could encode 5 and and push that filter to the server side and not have to decode the bytes in any of these byte arrays um, and do comparisons just on those bytes. 
for the compound cell encoding, uh, we're just proposing that we use strict protobuf. Protobuf is a tag encoding. Um, it supports you know, finding subfields. Uh, its tags are actually very similar to the, um, the compound key encoding that we propose. Uh, it doesn't require a write schema because all of the all of the columns essentially in a, a compound value are labeled with the field number that was in the original schema. So if you only had nine fields in the original schema and you see a 10, you can just ignore that extra column, right? Because everything is labeled that supports this. Uh, it doesn't require the right schema. And it also supports nice things like atomic append to update your reference values and certain things that could be used as optimizations later, although they're, they're not strictly required. So interpreting an entire byte array, for instance, you take whatever value for a particular field is in the past. So you can just keep stacking those up if you don't want to deserialize and change the value. Okay. And I'll hand it over to John to talk about the program. So, so we talked about this um, after the Beatrice comment. Um, and kind of subsequently after that. So um, I've been actually doing some implementation inside of Phoenix, trying to turn these things through. Um, thus far, I have uh, kind of wired the data type or the HBase kind of um, long type into Phoenix um, and uh, been able to push that all the way through, delving and test the paths, back up from the So, um, you know, the single type is able to do that. Um, right now, I'm in the process of uh, that was kind of the easy case. Now I'm attacking the hard case, which is the bar card case, which is everywhere. Um, and uh, I'm probably going to check with uh, James a little bit more, but basically there's a bunch of places where um, this encoding is uh, kind of working. Uh, basically, the way the way Phoenix is, is you've got kind of a table that points to where all the rest of the table information is, and I've got it working through that table. Uh, right now I have problems with filters and some other things, uh, but uh, I've been able to essentially push um, proposed um, character encoding, byte array encoding, um, into a prototype version of Phoenix um, and working through the uh, working test cases at the moment. Um, the good news with this is kind of finding out where all these compound work keys are used and to make sure that they're kind of uh, properly encapsulated in the API that all allows to replace it with the things that we can have that things can make things happen to the trace. Um, and then once we do that, we would probably wire in the data type struct or a modified version that encodes um, the uh, compound keys in the way that line encodes into Phoenix itself. Um, hopefully, it's a place where uh, we can just iterate and work out the rest of the Phoenix types into this little scheme. Um, yeah, uh, I think the next slide is probably good. There's a couple questions that we have about the types. We can probably discuss this afterwards. But, um, yeah, I think it's just a couple of questions. Yeah, so we have a couple of questions. We'll chat more after once. But um, yeah, there's some bug tracking we have to do. I have to figure out which key is the one that we would like to use. Um, there's some other questions as well that we're going to be talking about. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, so, how do you see the Express client API evolving? Do you see any change in the current? So one thing I'm excited about, and I, I won't actually speak to the really guy necessarily because I'm, I'm not familiar with that so much, but I really want uh, to be able to share more code in the application. But that's actually what Kite is trying to do. We're trying to make it so that you have this data layer on top of the loop and HDFS and HBase kind of the same. So Phoenix has done a lot of great work with uh, you know, expressing what you want and then having that translate into efficient operations that can be pushed to server side, uh, doing skip scans and, and things like that. I'm really excited about having that as uh, something other projects can leverage. So uh, I'm working on the matching build and Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I don't see us changing core HPS API at the end of the day, it's only by some bytes. Um, there will be an API on top. It could be type, data types. There's many different entry points um, to how this stuff is encoded. Uh, the data types API has this nice feature where if data is encoded in a different way, 
we've got this logical encapsulation of what the things mean. Um, the representation can be anything that we need. So you know, depending on which approach you take, um, there are going to be APIs that will type the data out of the HMS. You can kind of split the data out of the HMS. It's a little bit of a hot. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go back so you're asking about taking multiple or multiple cells and treating those as a list. Is that correct? So this doesn't actually cover that case. This covers the case where you want to have uh, multiple values within a single cell represented as a list. So this doesn't actually get into the higher level APIs of how you uh, interpret what's in there. Um, so for example, Kite, uh, the project I worked on, if you want to have several fields in the same uh, cell, then you have to define a record and then map that entire record to that cell. Whereas other systems may say you can select five cells from your, your root record schema and have those serialized and it will come up with that. So this doesn't actually dictate that, how the systems interpret that, but um, it tells us how to store that data for it. Um, I would really like to tackle those things, um, to, to have those options. I think that's a great idea. So one thing Kite supports is the, the um, key is column, which is pretty much what you're talking about, except using the map. So you have a column family, and then anything underneath that is considered a, a string key in that map. Um, I think that's something that we should tackle after agreeing on the other you know, how to represent these things as well. Because there are several things that we still need to agree on. Things like, you know, which epoch you use for date. Uh, is it four bytes or eight bytes and things like that. So I think that's, that's the next step. Yes? Um, so big integer is a subtype of decimal, right, where the scale is zero. Um, so we actually do have a decimal encoding here, where it's a fixed scale decimal. Uh, the scale is uh, dependent on your schema, which is not something that we tackle. Like, again, uh, schema is external to this work, but uh, it basically says you know, these bytes are the unscaled value or the big integer part of it, as um, big Indian uh, two's complement. Or you can have a, a four or eight five integer you know, underlying value. Actually, I think we just have to choose one, which is actually a good example of where you know we define how to take a decimal that represents its bytes, and then we don't have to worry necessarily about null bytes included or anything because we embed those bytes in the. Uh, Any other questions? I should add the uh, uh, decimal and big integer. It is actually something that we should use as an open question on this slide because Phoenix does it differently. And I forgot, um, we need to get more information on how they do it. All right, well, there are no other questions. I think we'll begin to see if I Thank you. So, uh, the way of agenda, we're going to start with an introduction. I'm going to assume that you don't actually know what the block patch is, uh, which may or may not be relevant to the search, but the visa. And then uh, I want to look at why we actually did it, what it's benefited, provided for us. And 
then uh, look at some of the available information for block action, some uh, details about how you can figure them to make them work better for you. Okay, so as kind of a refresher, this is an overview of the recap database. So when a request for data comes into the system, uh, the request contains details about what key values are uh, being requested from the store. And that, that request is broken down uh, at the store layer. And in the event that those that data is stored on disk, it's not already in the collection. Um, the system will read those data off the disk to certain surplus. So instead of throwing that data away and the request is broken, it's actually those the data that was read off the disk is stored into the system called the block cache. So what is a block? Block is a segment of the data that's been read off of the new trial. So this is a diagram uh, from this uh, really good blog post from uh, Aaron last year. There's, uh, you can think of the, the block as just a segment of the data from the new trial. So there's four different kinds of blocks in this case. The ones that we primarily are interested in are data blocks and the next blocks. A data block contains the actual data, the user data, that's been written into the system. Index blocks are used to locate the data inside of the data file. So there's a multi-level feature index that is used to facilitate seeking to the particular block that contains the data that's of interest. There's also uh, meta blocks and uh, the blue blocks. That's the other thing. So the blue blocks are interesting because you know, as part of the recap, um, we can examine the blue blocks and a blue filter that's been written out. Of the data that's stored. So during the repath, we can look at the blue block and determine whether the H file actually contains data relevant to the query at all. If it's not relevant, then we can exclude the file, copy the file, and the query will be done. So why are the caching blocks? The reason is that this guy is expensive, particularly expensive compared to reading data out of memory. So, this is to give you kind of uh, an idea of how expensive it is. It traces randomly accessing data from the underlying store. So it's really disk seek in order to retrieve data at the service for you. And that disk seek is actually taking quite a lot of time compared to memory access, by order of magnitude more time than that, which is quite substantial. And not only that, but uh, reading requires multiple seeks. So like I mentioned, there's the index blocks that describe the Tree structure for locating a data block. Uh, that's a multi level index, and uh, you would need to read potentially multiple index blocks in order to get to the underlying data block. So, we don't want to pay that price over and over and over again. We want to be servicing reads in, in milliseconds, not uh, hundreds of milliseconds. So, we can save ourselves that effort by keeping blocks around. The Database comes with a number of different block cache implementations. This is the default block element block cache. It's a relatively simple structure. It's an obvious data structure and it's using the, the, the current cache map, which is the JPM. It manages memory uh, in <coughs> segments, so it's keeping track of how often a block is accessed. Right? There's a finite amount of memory, so eventually you have to evict blocks from the cache. So what it does is it keeps track of how often a block is requested. The block is, is read at least a single time, it has that single allocation. If you hit it again, it gets promoted to the multi state. And then there's a third kind of priority called in memory, which is something you can control on your table schema. So when you're table your column family, you can indicate that it's an in memory column now, and then it will be promoted to this to a special area, the block action. And the reason we have this promotion kind of system is to avoid crashing the cache from the scan. So if your access pattern is primarily random or some random reads, uh, you're going to be picking those blocks in multiple times, presumably. But then for some reason, you do a longer scan. And you have a uh, longer query to execute. And in this scan, you're just reading over the blocks. And, and it's that one time, right? It's a kind of a long thing. So instead of having that scan effectively throw out all of the Data that's already been written in memory. Uh, this is going to be track of that and it allows those blocks to be shown to blockers. Okay. 
individuals have a background in the ecosystem, there's background to it, it's been a very long time. It's been a very long time. It's been a long time. We actually have an additional digit on our HP security assignment, so it's been quite a lot. There's some interesting configurations for the block hash. Really, there's only one that you should find on this paradox, which is how big it is. So this is defined in terms of proportion to the overall heap size that's available. So we're basically balancing block hash size, which is known as size, and then any additional memory is used for regular HPS operations. To make it more fine grained with that, you can treat those percentages. So by default, 25% of the total block is allocated for the single access, 50% for the multi access, and 25% of the individual access. So you want more control over how one of these bits is going to be between the blocks, you can treat these things a little bit easier. But by and large, this is not really necessary. The second block hash implementation that we Added in, in, in the production <laughs> uses the slot cache. The slot cache is different from the block cache, the, the LED block cache, because its goal is to move data off. Uh, the idea being that you can have less GC, uh, less GC time and process in a single time if you're managing memory outside of the data. So that's the initial design goal of this implementation. <clears throat> it's implemented as a multi level block cache. So there's uh, an LRU block hash that sits in front of the slab cache, and blocks are read into both, and both are kind of on their own independent So it's, uh, one isn't really aware of the other. The interaction there is defined by the double block hash, which is essentially a, a multi level block hash strategy. So when you configure when you're able to sync, it's allocated memory to off the heap, and it's easy to direct that buffer to the eye in order to do that. And that means that the blocks have to be copied uh, from the off heap structure onto the uh, heap memory before they can be processed with digits. But in practice, this turns out to be much more efficient than uh, not using uh, the block memory, that extra, uh, not having that extra memory and being able to catch that. Memory. This has been a little bit newer, but still, uh, in terms of its base uh, uh, generation, so it was introduced first in 92. Um, I want to have a segment on an kind of history view from the picking up this one um, because I think it hasn't seen a lot of production of plates. When we migrated to 94, they were uh, they actually broke it and we didn't realize it until uh, a long time after. So uh, I would discourage you from uh, looking at it. If, however, you are for some reason working with a legacy system and you think that uh, you need to keep the kids of version 92 or something like this, uh, version of HBase, and you, you've been running for a little bit longer and you still have to be down some improvements on it, you can put this on and, and make this fit. So here are some configuration settings that you can Basically, you say how much off the memory you want to use. Uh, this is defined as a percentage of the direct memory allocated to the JVM. And then you can specify the target block size and, and the sizes of those memory slots. Right? It's not an unbeat structure, which means that blocks have to be fit into the regions of memory that are not dynamic. And so that's why these, these uh, slot proportions and slot size settings are made available. By default, there's only two sizes. Block one size set of one area of memory that's roughly the size of the default block. Another area of memory that's roughly twice the size of the block is larger than the 2x the default size, it simply can't be cached by the system. But because of the way that the double block cache works, uh, they, that block will hopefully be put by the other cache. So we have a second implementation for, that supports off heap memory. This is the one that I'm pointing to. I'm curious to explore this as a It's called the public cache. Like the slide cache, it's a multi level cache. In that it has an LED block cache sitting in front of it. Unlike the slab cache, uh, it uses the, it is designed to use the LED block cache, the non heap cache, only for the meta and index blocks. So data blocks are stored off heap, everything else is stored off heap, and that's the way that the data is divided. Meta implementation is sitting in that combined block cache. Uh, topic that you're curious about. 
by the side path portion is based on the and the target block size, and things are very different. What's interesting here, though, is that it has a couple different operating modes. So there's an on-heat mode, which is obviously going to increase the forces of the testing on itself. And there's two different modes that can be used for off-heat data. And off-heat mode, I made, is the most obvious. It works the same way as the side path, in that it depends on direct memory that's produced with JVM. The other mode is file mode, which uh, you can just to have an access file on it to interact with that area of storage. Um, I've had luck taking the file mode and mounting and pointing it for a uh, file that's sitting on a tablet that's mounted partition in the way to use an off-key memory that way. So both of those are kind of interesting deployments. Effectively, they're, they're identical. It's just a matter of what's more convenient for you to your and your system. And also, uh, even using the body mode here, blocks have to be copied on and off of this um, segment of memory because these aren't actual Java objects. Right? This is a, a, a blob of bytes that's made available for storing this data. And so these bytes have to be converted to the actual object objects that they gave in Java language. Uh, the bucket cache has been available <coughs> since uh, 96, so you should, you should check it out. It's a little more complex to configure. Uh, I have a little ticket to make this a little bit less hairy. And, uh, but the idea here is that you choose your high energy, and then you specify the size, and then you, you tell it how much of an LRU block cache you want, how much of the, the remaining size should be used for the, the bucket cache itself, and then like the slot cache, you can make some tweaks the, the size of those buckets. That's actually a new feature that I'm just got to So which one should you choose and when should you run uh, bucket cache? When should you use the default and why? I did a, a blog post uh, over, giving an overview of this sort of thing. So I, I took these different implementations, I put together configurations uh, that are focusing on the implementation of one versus the other. That I have had them through the performance evaluation. The details is a, a good write up there. The basic idea uh, behind this set of tests was to look at how the different implementations perform in two different ways. The first is uh, to put the total amount of data that's being managed, the total amount of memory that's being managed by the system. So I was curious to know which one of these systems, how they, how they work, how they keep the bugs in memory. 16, which is 32, 128 gigabytes, et cetera, et cetera. How do they scale up in the implementation? But the thing I was curious about is how do they scale when the database size is really much, much larger than the amount of memory available for caching? And so if I have a small amount, of, relatively small amount of data, I have enough RAM that I can fit all of that data into the block cache. Uh, there's not going to be very much block eviction happening, so that'll be a different kind of operation steady state versus if my data size is drastically over the five x, ten x, fifteen x, something like this, then the amount of memory that we have available in the cluster. So how do the different implications perform uh, according to these two different kind of scenarios? I found that when you have enough memory to cache your entire data set, even with larger and larger heap sizes, the LRU block cache is sufficient. And my theory for that is that because there's no block evictions happening. No additional graphics easy overhead because there's no blocks being thrown away, and that actually works quite well. This is uh, all this testing was done with a read only workflow copy. So, if you have a mixed read write workflow, then there would be with the expiring blocks and that would lead to evictions and so forth. The other thing that was interesting here uh, is that the, I found the bucket cache actually scales very well, both as it gets larger and larger, um, more and more than ever, and, and also as the Ratio of the amount of data stored in the system and the amount of memory available is that ratio changes. The bucket cache performs very, very well in both those scenarios. The slot cache didn't do as well as the bucket cache as I increased the amount of memory available to it. The machines I was working with, though, only had 64 gigabytes of average. So I'd like to experiment with this further on the machine with more memory. 56 gig. So that's all I have for you. If you're interested in the blog cache, the two blog posts are available.
cash is the entry point. And uh, the conference of questions. Thank you. So, so, so how to, I mean, we can say that it's a little bit of 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 sharing the same block path. So there's only one available with whatever you choose is the only one that's kind of The way you enable it uh, by default, uh, when the block path is enabled, uh, if you want to turn on the bucket cache, uh, you specify the bucket engine type so that I have engine. That's the, the clue for the system to turn it on. And then it'll look for those other, other configurations to see you know, how much how much you do the other engine to do. That's right. So you put these, you put a value for these settings, and you just type it to the site that's going to have. And there's no computer server. Could you compare that to the bucket cache on the bucket cache? Yes. The bucket cache on people is the one that's called it. The LRU block cache is much better with on because I think because the LRU block cache is the one that's called on. So you get all of the penalties of a large memory in the beginning, all the garbage collection penalties, plus the zero vision penalties. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, quite a lot of garbage. I haven't done uh, too much creeping if they give it the garbage collector settings and all this. If all of the runs I did were run with the same configuration. So um, as a follow-on work, I'd like to provide some kind of reference configurations for using so the bucket cache. You have uh, this much uh, sorry, this much available memory and you're working with this kind of access pattern and here's a reference configuration that you can apply to the garbage collector settings and see how to match that. That's more work we've done. We'd like to talk about Yeah, I did, but with uh, type of SNL, I haven't tried it with uh, <coughs> a very interesting use case would be with the SSD. I haven't uh, had an issue with the SSD. They're essentially popular. In this, this uh, figure for the circle dots, that's actually dots for both of them. That's under so there's a triangle and a square. You got the exact similar latencies with offbeat as well as the same uh, Same with direct memory versus the kind of us. And within a fraction of the list of us. And the questions? Yeah, thank you. So that's it for our materials tonight. Uh, we've got a bit of time. I think we're not going to keep that in space for another couple of minutes. Um, thanks for coming and, and feel free to find your friends here in the United States. Thanks for streaming. Yeah, it worked pretty well. That's great. It's great. Hi, I'm Kate. Hey, I work for Potter. I know. I know. Oh, okay. I spoke with Justin. He said he was going to be like, oh, but I didn't, I didn't see anything on it. I didn't see anything. I submitted it to just online to the data. Well, I saw that then. She had submitted it something as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there were there were a bunch of props oh, that were. I, I, I can show you. Just give me one second. Sure, sure.